Hello and welcome to Faith Backstage, where we are having backstage conversations about faith, life, and ministry. I'm your host, Joey, and I am joined today by Jason Johnson. How are you, Jason? Yeah, doing great, Joey. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. It's funny, we were talking in our pre-interview about the book Onward by the CEO of Starbucks, and I was just curious, are you a coffee drinker? I am. I, I drink probably more coffee than I should, but I justify it by drinking a lot of water every day. So good. uh, It tends to balance itself out. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Big coffee drinker. My, my, I'm newly married. My wife is not, but I'm trying to convert her. (laughs) Yeah. You know, my wife, we've been married. It'll be 19 years of the summer and she does not drink coffee. And I jokingly tell her, um, I have no disappointments in her or our marriage at all, except for that. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Because I've never been able to sit on the patio and drink a cup of coffee with my wife. And the non-coffee drinkers will say, well, I could drink something else like hot chocolate or tea. And I say, but that's not having coffee with your wife. It's just not the same. It's not the same. I fully agree. (laughs) Uh, Well, I want to get to know you a little bit. Uh, We have a lot of great uh, topics that I'm really excited to jump into for this conversation, but I just want to kind of get to know your background, your testimony. Um, Where did you grow up? Where does your story start? My story starts in Dallas. So I grew up in the Dallas area and all of my family um, is still pretty much there. My two sisters, uh, their husbands, kiddos, and my brother and his wife, and then my parents uh, are still there as well. So that's home. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and what kind, were you raised in any kind of faith uh, yeah, environment? Yeah. yeah, so my dad's been in ministry my whole life, so I've been raised in the church. Um, I'm, a, I'm a PK, a pastor's kid. Dang. Uh, and so that's been my background. He's had several different roles at, at churches uh, throughout my life, but um, that, that's my story. I was there all the time, and we were front row kids, and I got to see the ins and the outs and the good and the bad behind the scenes of everything. Yeah, totally. Did that, was there ever a moment when you kind of had to have a, like, almost like a healthy deconstruction, like a kind of reconsidering your faith and making your faith your own? And and what what did that look like? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, there was an ongoing dialogue in my head, most of my childhood, remembering, remembering back, uh, just knowing at an early age that I would probably be involved in ministry in some capacity, but also kind of fighting it. Mm. Uh, I, I saw the good. I saw the ugly. I saw, I saw a lot uh, behind the scenes of the church and my dad's, my dad's a great shepherd. And it's not because um, it's not that I didn't want to do it or didn't want to follow God in that regard, because I didn't like how my dad did it. It's actually quite the opposite. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a great shepherd. And I thought, you know, if, if, if you get beat up this bad by people, for being a good guy and a good shepherd. No, thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll find something else. And, and, you know, I, later into my teenage years, that translated into um, something bigger, you know, more than just my calling to ministry, but just my whole perception of why is it that people who claim to celebrate this God and be saved by this Jesus, how is it they can be so awful? Uh, to people who yeah. are doing, trying to do such good. And so, yeah, there was kind of a deconstruction, reconstruction. And, and I went off to college, um, you know, saying, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, as long as it has nothing to do with ministry, you know, as, <laughs> you know, and in looking back, it's God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, as long as it has nothing to do with what you want me to do. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I went, I went into uh, college pre-law, um, you know, because wow. as a kid, I always thought, I feel like I'm going to be a communicator and kind of a researcher and a writer. And, um, and I'll just do that in law and I'll make a lot more money and people can, you know, be mean and whatever, but that's okay because it's the legal world. Like, it's not like the church world, like it's to be expected. Uh, why would I make less money? and still get beat up in a world where people should be nicer, right? And so, uh, yeah. and then uh, immediately um, in my freshman year of college, all that got flipped upside down. I started to get involved in the ministry and it, it was as if God was saying, you know, you can run and you can fight it, but um, eventually I'm going to get you. And uh, and when I settled in to, to getting involved in the ministry, it just felt right. Like, okay, yeah. years of questioning and running and trying to avoid, but this feels right. 
Yeah, totally. What was your first time getting involved in ministry? Like, what did that look like practically? Yeah, practically, it was, you know, I was always a youth group kid in high school, but I came off to college and I was a bit terrified, actually, going off to a big school. I was afraid that I would get quickly sucked up into a world that I wouldn't be able to get myself out of. Um, Mm. And so, uh, thankfully, by the grace of God, there were some guys in my dorm my freshman year who invited me to go to a freshman Bible study, a huge Bible study on campus. And the the small groups were led by sophomores. And that's really what struck me was I had these, I had some sophomore guys that were leading our particular group that I just thought these are cool guys who love Jesus are doing ministry. Uh, and like, I would hang out with them because my perception growing up was if you're a Christian, you're kind of a dork. Uh, The only alternative to doing like fun things is you go bowling or whatever, right? As a youth group. And I thought it's just, it's, I don't know. And so for the first time, I felt like this sounds so uh, vain, but I felt like I saw cool guys who love Jesus, love doing ministry, love pouring into people. And I saw that and thought, that's what I want. That's, I want to be like that. And so it kind of spurred in me, okay, maybe I can do ministry like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not like how I've kind of grown up with a perception of what it's going to be like, but these guys are doing it in a way that I feel like I can do it. And so that really drew me in. And then they invited me to go and work at a summer camp that summer after my freshman year. And that immediately thrust me into ministry, working with students. I came back from that and started to work for a youth ministry in Houston for a few years during college. So most of my college experience was actually spent uh, working at a church, um, doing student ministry with a team. And, uh, and that was it. I, I saw guys that um, I respected, that loved each other, that loved Jesus, were cool, had fun, and they, they loved pouring into people. And that, yeah. that just clicked for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Did, you ever, when, did you ever have a resistance, even in that time, to being specifically a pastor? And when did you realize yeah. that you were like open and willing and like that was what God was calling you to? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I came back from that summer of youth camp, a very large Christian youth youth sports camp. Uh, and I had the same conversation with God. All right, God, I get, I get it. Like, I- I'll do ministry. I'll do whatever you want me to do in ministry, as long as it has nothing to do with teenagers, because I just spent a <laughs> summer with seventh grade boys. Yeah. And that was miserable. I mean, golly, miserable. And I'm not a camp guy. <laughs> I'm not a rah-rah guy. I'm not a very fun guy, actually. And uh, um, I just felt like for my personality and for my gifting, I just can't imagine doing student ministry. And so, of course, God laughs and I end up doing student ministry for about seven or eight years. Uh, And um, I actually worked for a guy who eventually, uh, I'm kind of uh, geographically placing myself here, but I worked for a youth pastor in Houston who eventually uh, moved to Austin uh, in Texas and planted a church called Austin Stone Community Church, which has become a pretty significant, amazing church. And uh, I got to be a part of his church planting journey early on, just to fly on the wall, kind of watch it all play out. Yeah. Um, and um, moved on from student ministry to working with young adults and then curriculum writing. And that was really fun. I enjoyed that, writing a lot of curriculum, doing a lot of content development. And then he called in Austin and said, Hey, what do you think about coming to Austin? And so we had conversations and, uh, and I thought, man, amazing city, amazing church, amazing people leading this place. Like this is just the perfect, you know, scenario, but it never felt right. Uh, yeah. And so I finally had an honest conversation with him and said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I don't think I'm supposed to come here. And, uh, and this is a guy that's been a he was a mentor of mine for a long time and I respect and he said, you know, it's good to hear you say that because we've actually been talking on our leadership. We don't think you should be here either. I'm like, whoa, that's <laughs> thanks, man. Appreciate it. He's like, no, 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 not like that. Not not like we don't want you here. But he said, the more we interact with you, the more we the more I see myself in you several years mm. ago. And I know that the only thing that's really going to scratch that itch that you don't even know you have is you don't need to just come work for another church and fold into um, you know, our, our structure, I really think we think you need to plant a church and wow. we want to help you do that. And I thought, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're way, <laughs> you're way out of bounds on that one. That's just uh, not my personality. It's not. 
you know, there's, there used to be used a lot, this grid um, in the church planting world. I don't think it is much anymore, but when I started out, they talked about prophet, priest, king, kind of Mm. um, this, this triad of giftings, callings, and how Jesus was the perfect, um, perfect uh, blend of all of those. Uh, He was prophetic. He spoke truth, but he was priestly. He loved people. He was a king. He carried Mm -hmm. himself with authority. You know, and I always looked at guys like my dad, who's just very priestly and shepherdly and Mm. loves people. And I thought, man, (laughs) that's not me. Like, of course, I love people, but like, you know, uh, it's just not my default, right, is to to do that. Um, I would probably venture more towards the prophet side, like just speaking truth and and not unlovingly, but just a little more assertive and... um, and so I kind of grew up with this perception of in order to be a pastor, you have to be super shepherdly and priestly mm. and loving. And I knew myself well enough early on to know, gosh, I don't know if I can do that because that's just not me. And so I kind of got wrapped up in this, this world of, well, you know, there's priests and there's kings and there's there's prophets and, yeah. uh, and identifying who you are and then kind of surrounding yourself with other people who can help balance. And, and so I saw that and I thought, well, maybe there is a place for me. Um, and so we did pursue the church planting and, um, and that's what ultimately led me into kind of that lead pastor role for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's crazy. It's yeah. It's funny. I, um, I don't really ever see myself being a pastor. I, I, my highest spiritual gift, uh, thing is teaching, but pastoring is really low. And so I definitely feel that kind of like, um, dichotomy there of, of, I I don't think shepherding is very high for me. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not for me either. You know, I think maybe the older I get, the more it is, but uh, also the older I get, the more I recognize, um, it's really about the teams that you have and the people you have around you. And are you able to build out good systems? And so for me, I'm a systems guy. I'm, I'm a strategy. I, I like to build out systems and put people in the right places and empower them. And so from very early on in our church plant, we made it very clear, this is not going to be about any individual personality. It's not Mm -hmm. going to be about any individual person. And even as our team grew and our staff grew, so did our, our titles, they, they evolved and they changed. Right. So um, it was, it was every week that myself or any, any other pastor on staff at our church would stand up on stage and say, you know, Hey, Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. Right. Right. Uh, these people didn't need to know, you know, a, a few, a handful of people knew, but for the most part, most people didn't realize, you know, when I say I'm the pastor here, that also means like it literally started in my living room. Right. Like mm. I started this thing, but I don't, I don't care about that. I don't care that they know that. And if, if, if they see, um, if they kind of lean towards, you know, a different person on staff as like their shepherd and their pastor. Great. Right. Cause you get to a point where, you can't know everybody. And if you try to know everybody the same or shepherd everyone the same, you're not really going to shepherd anybody at all, right? You're going to spread yourself too thin. And so uh, it, it was fun to get stopped in the grocery store or somewhere and, and someone would say, hey, aren't you, on, aren't you one of those guys on staff at that church? And I loved mm-hmm. that, you know, because yeah. it's just, yes, I'm just one of, one of the team members um, among many other team members who are so good in different areas of what they do. And I really think that was, that was the key. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the church plant uh, yep. before we jump into, I want to spend the bulk of our time, you know, focusing on foster care, sure. but I am curious what just kind of was like the most difficult thing about that process of planning a church. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I'm sure there were several. <laughs> yeah. It's always the people, mm. um, you know, at least for me, the, 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 strategic planning, the building out the systems, the, all that stuff. Um, that's probably where I, I lean more in, t- in, t- in terms of gifting, but the people are always the hardest because people are messy and people are difficult. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so what I would tell church planters after the fact all the time is anticipate that the, the people initially you expect the most out of are going to let you down the most. Mm. And then those people that you don't really expect much out of, or you don't even know at all right now, are eventually going to be the ones that really help carry the banner for this thing and um, invest deeply in this thing. Um, and that's just true in the church planting world. And I think I think 
it's okay, right? Like you need, um, it's okay to a certain degree. Um, it takes a certain kind of person and personality and mix of gifts to be someone who says, we're gonna leave where we are and we're gonna join this little group of 10 or 20 people that meet in a living room with nothing but vision and we're gonna help build this thing. And then as that thing gets built, perhaps those same personalities or those same gift sets begin to say, well, you know, I think, I feel like we've, we've done what we needed to do. We helped start this thing and build this thing. And maybe yeah. now it's time for us to move on. Um, so while it might make sense and it's not always done well, uh, mm -hmm. that moving on, but while it might make sense, it doesn't necessarily make it easy, um, mm. for, for people to say, we have a, we, we feel like it's time for us to leave, but you know, at the same time for every one person early on that might have said, we feel like we've done what we need to do and we're going to move on. There were five other new people who were kind of jumping in and who were, you know, excited. And so it's just this this mixed bag of emotions of yeah. grief and loss, but also excitement and growth and look what God is doing. And, I, and not to sound over overly Jesus or biblical, but I, I think that's even kind of the ministry of Jesus. When you read through the gospels, it's really, he's carrying constantly this tension of grief and loss and letdown, but also mm. excitement of what God's doing, you know, and in the, in the disciples, the most, the most telling for me is there's a, there's a, a scenario where John the Baptist has just been murdered and Jesus is, is emotional over it, right? Like it, cause he's close. He obviously loves John the Baptist. And yet at the same time, he's just sent his disciples out in pairs with authority to go and preach and heal and, and perform miracles. And now they're coming back pumped, like excited, telling them, mm -hmm. you'll never believe all the cool things that happen, right? And so Jesus is carrying this grief of loss, but also balanced by this excitement of the disciples that he sent out and <clears throat> in what God is doing. Uh, and you kind of, in this moment, and his response to them in the middle of all that is, um, hey, let's go away for a while and rest. Right. Mm. I love that. Right. It's not, um, it, it's not, let's uh, pretend like the grief isn't there. It's not also let's ignore all the good stuff God's doing. I love just kind of that balance of, you know what, in the midst of this heavy, heavy tension of beauty and brokenness, sometimes the best thing that we can do is just, let's just rest for a little bit in all of that um, so that we can be healthy Um because if we just keep trying to power through it and push through it and not really deal with it, I think we eventually just find ourselves in an unhealthy place where we're no good to anybody. Yeah, totally. I love that. Um, so what is your current ministry and position? Like basically the, what's, what's the title on your business card right now in, in, in life? Yeah, the title's long and it doesn't <laughs> really explain much of anything, but I work for an organization called the Christian Alliance for Orphans. And um, it's a, it's a national, really international organization. It's, it's an alliance. It's a network of organizations and churches. But my title is National Director of Church Ministry Initiatives. So I oversee all things church related. So what does that mean? Well, when I was pastoring our church, a ton of people in our church started to get involved in foster care. It became a huge part of the culture of our church, uh, including my wife and I. So we became foster parents in 2012 in Houston. And we, uh, we adopted from foster care. Uh, we had kid, little kiddos come and go. We've, we uh, have had young moms live with us. So we've, we've kind of seen a lot of different sides of it. And while I was pastoring our church and our church was getting involved in foster care, other churches in Houston were saying, hey, how do we do that? What, what does that look mm -hmm. like for us? And so we actually started to work with a lot of churches in Houston, helping them to think through this. Um, and that kind of uncovered a passion in me for, I was doing a lot of church planting coaching at the time. And now we're doing a lot of coaching with churches on foster care ministry, kind of city engagement, local engagement into some really hard places. And I loved it. So I, I, I developed this passion of, I really love working with churches even more than I love working for a church. As much mm. as I loved our church, I really, really love working outside of our church for, with other churches. And so that just kind of, there's a long story there, but it evolved into me being given the opportunity to do that, to, to work with an organization 
where I get to do a lot of coaching with churches, strategic planning, um, resource development, and with organizations, so foster care agencies, um, different nonprofit organizations around the country uh, that are working with churches. And then outside of that, uh, I get to um, also spend a lot of time speaking at conferences, writing materials, and doing a lot of stuff for foster and adoptive families, just kind of on the encouragement side and on the training side, um, specifically with, with them. That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. Do you remember the first time discovering or just recognizing that foster care was like a serious need in the world and that the church was in a position to do something about it? Yeah, I do. I'll never forget it, actually. Um, you know, like many people and maybe even some listening now, um, my our story with my wife and I was um, kind of the one day story, maybe one day, maybe one day we'll adopt. We, we know we want to. And I think that was probably a part of me and a part of her separately before we even met each other. And so coming together, it was like, you know, hey, um, I think maybe one day uh, I want to adopt. Yeah, me too. I, and so it just kind of was part of our marriage from day one. But it was, mm. for a lot of people, it's the one day, right? Like one day we want to do that. Well, what is when is that one day? Well, when life slows down enough, when we have enough money, when our kids are the right age, it's all these metrics that never actually arrive. Uh, you never get to that one day. There's no, yeah. there's no point where anyone says life has slowed down enough. We have enough money. Our kids are the right age. And we feel like we are perfectly and fully equipped to do this now. Right. Um, no one in their right mind would do it then. Right. Hey, we've gotten <laughs> life to the state of nirvana and perfection <laughs> and total equilibrium. I have an idea. Let's do something that completely disrupts it. Right. Yeah. So it, we quickly discovered there is no one day, there's just today, right? There's never a perfect time to do this. Um, there's a lot of opportunities though to say yes, despite all the reasons you might have to say no. So mm. in our mind, adoption. So we took a bunch of people from our church to a conference in Austin, 2011, and it was an adoption conference. Uh, but my wife and I strolled into a breakout session on foster care. So imagine yourself in the conference world, it's, you know, main sessions and then a ton of breakouts and we stroll into this breakout session on foster care and we sat there for an hour and we listened to this guy talk about foster care in our city and what was going on and we walked out knowing um if what he just said is true and we knew it was uh <laughs> then nothing will ever be the same about our family mm -hmm. this completely changes the trajectory of our conversation in terms of adoption and nothing will ever be the same about our church the, this really if we want to be a church that impacts the city and is for the city we cannot pretend like this is not an issue in our city and not only is it an issue in our city it's an issue that acts as um, there are so many tributaries of social issues in our cities that have a direct link back to child and family welfare um, that to address foster care and child and family welfare is also to address these other issues, things mm -hmm. like homelessness, incarceration, uh, uh, poverty, um, trafficking, all of these things have direct links back to child and family welfare. So it changed the court, the trajectory of our family, we started to pursue the foster care track. And then it opened up our eyes to if churches, if churches really want, I've never met a church that says we are not interested at all in impacting the community around us, right? <laughs> right. Any legitimate church says no, that of course we wanna impact the community around us. And what we discovered was then on some level and in some capacity, this issue of foster care has to be on your radar. You cannot, you cannot truly impact the community around you without being aware of and somehow even uh, remotely engaged in this issue of child and family welfare. Yeah, totally. I love that. No, I would totally agree. I think yeah. I think the only reason churches would not be interested or willing is if they don't fully understand the need and don't fully understand the problem. There's that. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of competing things that we find in the church world. One of them is that lack of awareness. Mm. The other one, though, is... Um, you know, you and I, and a lot of people, we're aware of a lot of things. We're aware totally. of a lot of needs, um, but we don't engage in all of them. 
for several reasons, many, many different reasons. Um, so awareness is important for the church. And, and here's how we say it. You know, I, again, I've never met a church that would ever say to me, Jason, I just got to be honest. We don't care about vulnerable kids and families, right? And we're not interested. Of course, they wouldn't say that. So yeah. it's not that they don't care. It's that often they don't know how to care. Um, and so awareness Yes, on one hand is aware, being aware of the need around you, but that only goes so far because then it drives the question, well, how, how do we actually do it? And so we spend most of our time actually on the awareness, awareness of the how, um, because if we can provide simple, strategic, achievable um, next steps, yeah. then we find churches, it, it, uh, one of my favorite books, uh, a book, um, books written by the Heath brothers, Ship and Dan Heath, anything by them, I, I vouch for. But uh, a book called Switch, uh, I think it's they wrote it in Switch. And they said, sometimes what feels like resistance is often just a lack of clarity. Mm. And I love that. Because it might not be that the church is resistant. It might just be that they're not clear. Just yeah. show us how, give us some simple steps. Uh, a friend of mine says it this way. He says, we got to take, we got to make that six foot wall of foster care that most people see when they think of foster care. It's yeah. this big, massive brick cinder block <laughs> wall. We got to turn that six foot wall into six inch steps. Totally. Um, and that helps clarify the how, but then we're confronted with another tension. And that tension is many of our churches, um, most of our churches live in this tension that they hold internally of, we want to be a safe place, a comfortable place. We want to have good coffee, comfortable seats, a great service, a great experience. Yeah. That your kids love, your family loves, it's safe. Uh, and now what you're doing is inviting us into some hard and uncomfortable places. And how do we hold that tension? And so we spend a lot of time with churches, you know, again, saying, what we don't do is throw caution to the wind. We don't say, mm -hmm. um, let's charge the, let's charge the gates of hell with the water pistol. No, let's be smart. Let's be strategic and let's build out structures and systems within your church that, so that ultimately you can say, this is a safe place, but it's a safe place for us to do hard things together. Yeah. That's what we want. Um, that we, you can do hard things and know that you have support here. You have, mm. you have resources here. You have a safe place here to be sent out to do hard things. Um, and at the end of the day, we find that's when churches, they go, yes, that's what we want. Mm. Now the question is how, what's that next six inch step for us? Yeah, totally. You talk in your book, uh, everybody can do something about the idea of like proof of concept and like helping churches understand like what is this actually going to look like practically um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of helping them on that road. Um, yeah. What do you think are some of the fears and concerns that keep individual families from being willing or taking that next step to pursue foster care for them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most of it's fear. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, there's layers of fear. So, um, we'll often hear said, uh, we're just, we're afraid of getting too attached. We're afraid of attaching to a mm -hmm. child and then having to let them go because the end goal of foster care isn't to keep a child necessarily. The end goal of foster care is to give yourself to a child. So we say it this way, the goal of foster care isn't to get a child for your family. It's mm. to give your family for a child. Wow. Um, and so what we're, what we're pursuing initially and, and always to a certain degree is restoration and health with biological family. Now that's not always going to be the case. It, it doesn't always play out that way. Yeah. But we're giving ourselves to that process for the sake of these kids. Sometimes it, we live in a broken world. And so sometimes it doesn't turn out that way. And these kids need to be adopted. Uh, but initial, you know, our posture going in is to give. So probably the number one fear that we hear expressed is I'm afraid of getting attached and loving this mm -hmm. kid as my own and then having to let them go. So I say layers of fear because mm -hmm. uh, I call that kind of the fruit of the fear. That's kind of the top layer, but there's a root fear underneath that 
that's a different layer that is the one that we actually need to address. So when I hear people say, I'm afraid of getting too attached, they're not actually afraid of getting too attached. I think they know we are going to get attached. And, mm -hmm. and we say, perfect, then you'd be perfect for this because that's exactly what these kids need. Mm. So people who are afraid of getting too attached love getting attached to things. Like they love deeply and they love passionately. Yeah. That's not their fear. Their, the, their fear is not so much, I'm afraid of getting too attached. Their fear is, I'm afraid I, don't, I won't have what it takes to grieve like that. Mm. So their fear has nothing to do with attachment. It has nothing to do with these kids, in my opinion. What their fear has everything to do with grief and themselves. Um, so we tend to project fear outward and say, I'm afraid of getting attached out here to these kids out here. When really the real fear is, um, I'm afraid of the grief in here and my ability or inability to handle that grief well in here, right? So if that makes sense. Um, so that's where we want to address the fears. Another example, I'm afraid of the effects that it might have on my biological kids, right? Mm. When we open up our homes to hard things, um, we expose our, our kiddos to hard things. And so what does yeah. that look like? I and mean, that's a, that's a, these are all legitimate things to be thinking through. I would, I would not say, I can't believe you're thinking about that. If you really love Jesus, you won't care about the effect it has on your biological kids. No, of course not. We'd say, good. I'm glad you're thinking about that. Now yeah. let's get to the, let's get beneath that layer to the root layer of what the real fear might be, which is not, I'm afraid of the effect it's going to have on them. Um, actually we find most parent, most foster parents um, want this to have, a positive effect on, on their kids. Mm. So the fear is not the effect on my kids. The fear is I'm afraid that I won't have what it takes to really parent my kids through hard things so that it has a positive effect on them. So now the real fear is me and my ability to parent mm. through hard things, right? So I can keep going on and on, but um, where we really try to help people who are considering engaging in this is to get get beneath the initial layer yeah. and let's, let's get to the root of what's really going on in our hearts. And then I won't get preachy here, but just real quick, we, we yeah. like to, we like to, you know, take them to probably my favorite story in scripture in terms of God calling us to do things and us being confronted with this fear of, I don't have what it takes when, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 and we, most of us know the story, the disciples recognize there's an overwhelming need. And the mm -hmm. solution is we should send them away so they can get their need met, right? Uh, wow. And and Jesus says, uh, actually, you feed them. And, you know, typical Jesus fashion, he turns it back around on them. If I'm the disciples, I'm going, seriously, man, you got to stop doing it. it. Just let us send them <laughs> away, right? He says, you feed them. And so they go and get a few loaves of bread and a few fish, and they come back to Jesus and basically say to Jesus, we don't have what it takes to do what you're asking us to do. Mm. Um, we don't have what it takes to meet the need that you put in front of us. Jesus does not apologize to them. He does not say, you're right, guys. I'm so sorry. I never meant to put you in that uncomfortable position. I never want you to have to be confronted with the fact that you might not have what it takes. Mm. That's not what he says. I think, I think Jesus is far more comfortable with us being confronted by the fact that we don't have what it takes than we are. Um, so he purposely puts these guys in a position where they're forced to be confronted with the fact that they don't have what it takes. His solution, hey, give me what little you've got and watch what I can do with it. I can multiply it exponentially. And I'm going to show off a little bit even. There's going to be leftovers, right? So, you know, I'm afraid I don't have what it takes to grieve like that. Perfect. Give me what you got and watch what I can do with it. I'm afraid I don't have what it takes to parent my kids through this. Perfect. Give me what you got and watch what I can do with it. I'm afraid I don't have what it takes to give up control like this. Perfect. Give me what little you've got and watch what I can do with it. Um, and he'll multiply it uh, ex exponentially. And so I think we tend to think uh, the fact that I don't have what it takes to do what God's asking me to do obviously disqualifies me from mm. being used by him. Yeah. But actually what we see in the gospels is 
um, the reality that you don't have what it takes when you finally are faced with that and um, accept it, then that might actually be the point when you are able to be used by him most. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I think our culture, our Christian culture right now specifically is very into spiritual gifts. What is your natural gifting? What are you, what has God equipped you to do already? And if, when I look at the Bible, personally, I see people doing things outside of what they feel is kind of their natural <laughs> gifting or their natural yeah, yeah. Yeah. skill set or abilities. Um, and so I, I think it's beautiful, the idea of just, uh, you know, no one, no one is going to be perfect at this. No one's going to be like fully ready for it. Right. Um, yeah, that's right. But that's where God wants us. He wants us to be relying on his strength, on his, on his uh, character and, and, yeah, and abilities. Yeah, that's right. And you know, that's a, that's a thing that never goes away. I, I should, I, the disclaimer here is um, there's never really a point on this foster care journey where you get over the fact that you don't have what it takes, right? Like <laughs> there's never a point where you go, oh, I, yesterday I felt like I didn't have what it takes, but I feel like I woke up today and that's all gone. Now I'm, I'm in a new <laughs> season, right? If anything, yeah. it compounds, especially as you have kids in your home and you're dealing with trauma yeah. and you're dealing with really, really hard things. Um, this is going to be an issue that you're continually confronted with. And my goal is that people are equipped to deal with it well, that they're able to preach truth to themselves in those moments. They're able to fall back on what God says is true um, uh, in those moments. Otherwise, um, as we continually get kind of beat over the head with the reminder that the needs are far greater than our capacity to meet them. We don't have what it takes to do everything that God's calling us to do. Yeah. If we're not able to really preach truth to ourselves in those moments, then we'll eventually, we're just done. We're out, you know? Yeah. Totally. Uh, and what these kids and these families need are people who are willing um, to, to say, we don't have what it takes, but man, we're in, mm. uh, we're, we're doing this um, because we know that God can take what little we have to offer today and he can do, far more with it than we ever could. Yeah, totally. Um, you mentioned uncomfortability in the church and how people are, are fr afraid to be uncomfortable, especially coming on Sunday morning. They want their coffee. They want their donut. They want to hear a uh, uh, ex exciting message that makes them feel good. Um, and I think it, we just have a tendency to be afraid of uncomfortability. And I think bringing kids from, and I'm doing air quotes if anybody isn't watching the video, uh, the outside world uh, into, into their home. Um, but what would you say, having done this kind of ministry for so long and having biological kids of your own and seeing that relationship, what is the benefit of exposing your, your kids to the hard thing, hard worldly things sure, yeah. um, of, of the world? Yeah. Uh, um, I used to be afraid of the effect that opening our home to this would have on our biological daughters. Um, now, after the fact, I'm more afraid of the effect not opening our home to foster care would have mm -hmm. had on our biological father, our, our biological daughters. And I think because the default parenting position for most people, especially in the church, is to pursue safety and comfort yeah. and convenience and shelter like purity at all costs. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just we want to isolate and insulate. And so I'm, yeah. I'm going to here's kind of the bigger the bigger story, the bigger narrative that most of us are living in, the narrative is we are, we are subtly and even overtly at times taught by our culture um, that when you see hard things, when you see uncomfortable things, when you see dangerous things, uh, your natural default should be to isolate and insulate, to move away from them. Mm. Um, and, and then what we see in the gospel is actually something quite different. What we see in the gospel is God moving towards hard places and broken people. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, frankly. So somewhere in the mix of all of Christmas is lost the fact that um, God in his glory looked down on the brokenness of humanity and said, I'm going to enter into that and I'm going to wrap myself up in that and I'm going to live among that and I'm going to be broken by that so that they don't have to be broken anymore. Could God have just stayed up in heaven, snapped his fingers and fixed everything? Yeah, but that's not how God fixes things. God fixes things by, by immersing himself in those things. Um, and so what we can't be is people who raise our hands and worship to that. 
and then use those same hands to push the brokenness of other mm. people away. Yeah. So there, I got a little preachy, but <laughs> it translates not only into how we are as mom and dad, as parents, in terms of how we're living out the gospel and what our posture is, but how we ultimately parent. And so here's what we say, I say to people is um, uh, there, we want our girls and they have been uh, to be exposed to some hard things. And there's a very, very fine line. And the line is not clear. And the line is constantly moving. Every day yeah. the line moves. And every day as parents, we have to identify where's that line today. Uh, the line between we want them to feel the weight of this, but we don't want them to resent it. Mm. And there's a fine line there and it's always moving. So our girls have, they, our girl, here's the, been the benefit is our girls grow up in a world now that they know is far more complex and far more nuanced than the world that most of their friends are growing up in or it, that most of their friends are aware of around them, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, they've had teenage moms live with us. Uh, they've had um, little girls their age live with us and go, they have a sister who came to us because um, it wasn't safe for her to be at home, right? They just live in a different world with a different perspective and different yeah. sensitivities. And we've seen that build empathy in them towards, towards people in a way that I don't know we would have ever been able to build for them. So I, I say this foster care has given our kids a gift that I don't think me as dad or my wife uh, as their mom would have ever been able to give them on our own. Um, and we don't know how that'll translate into their lives as they grow older. But what we do know is that they've had implanted within them the reality that the world is broken and that redemption is possible and that we move towards hard places. And that's just normal. It's just what we do. Uh, now, they've seen hard things. They've seen us weep. They've wept themselves. They've mm. had cops at our house looking for runaway teenagers. They've... Mm. Um, they've experienced letdowns. They've experienced the grief of having to say bye to a um, little girl that they've grown to love. They, they've run the gamut on those things. Yeah. But the fine line is, you know, um, we want them to feel the weight of it, but not resent it. And so there's been times that we've said, Hey, as a family, we just need to take a break right now. Like yeah. it, the weight, if we're not careful, the weight will quickly translate into resentment. So we're going to take a break. Mm. Um, so we always have our eye on that fine line. Um, and we've said no to some things that we didn't feel like would be safe for our girls or for our yeah. family at the time. So yeah. not being afraid to say no, always keeping your eye on that fine line, and then trusting that God is planting within them at an early age, um, an empathy and an awareness about the world around them. Yeah, that not only will show itself in some beautiful ways now as kids, but I think um, has the capacity to grow into some really beautiful things as they become adults themselves. Yeah, totally. I love that. That's beautiful. Um, in what ways are your relationships with your biological kids different than your adopted or foster kids? And in what ways are they the same? Um, well, they're the same because they're all our kids. Uh, I know that people around us look at our family as an adoptive family, but you talk to most adoptive families and they don't label themselves like that. Most of them don't, right? Like this is just our family. This is our yeah. daughter. This is our son, right? Mm. Um, but every kid's different. So yeah, it's not even so much a difference between um, our biological daughters and our adoptive daughter. It's, we have four daughters. It's the difference between each of the four, right? Yeah. Every kid needs to be parented differently. Every kid has their own thought patterns and perspectives and personalities and sensitivities. And so it's just finding you know, but but there are some there are some differences, and so in the adoption and foster care world, um, most families are very well aware of the fact that we're dealing with a lot of trauma uh, that expresses itself in a number of different ways, um, and traditional parenting does not work with um, with history of heavy trauma. Uh, it just doesn't work. Like, mm. you know, we may be able to say to one of our biological daughters, you know, especially when they were younger, um, uh, 
hey, I want you to go read for 10 minutes or, hey, you're in timeout for 30 seconds or, hey, I need you to go put your dishes away and brush your teeth. And, you know, it's okay, whatever. Uh, you can say the same things and have the same expectations for a kid who comes from trauma with with really hard backgrounds and and brain development. Not that they're, there's something wrong with them, like they're not smart, but just the neurons fire differently. The brain works differently because of trauma. And what's simple and clear to a kid who doesn't have that trauma is not simple and clear to a kid who does. And so it requires a completely different parenting style. So what that, what does that mean? So if you're a foster adoptive family listening to this, or you're one that's considering getting involved, uh, it will mean that sometimes, you know, your, some of your kids look at the way you parent other kids and go, well, that's not fair. Like, why are you letting her get away with that? Or why, why this or why that? You wouldn't let us. And so we've had to do a lot of education with our kiddos on, hey, it's different. Um, it's different for, for her um, because her brain is different and it works differently. And so we have to do things differently with her. And now they're old enough that they get it. Right. It doesn't always make it easier, but at least they understand. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, what makes men fathers uniquely equipped to be foster dads? Like what do they have to offer to a child of the foster care system, a child of, um, that is hurting, that is broken? Yeah, that's a great question because most of these kids, um, the father's not around or the father is the source of a lot of their Mm. problems. Yeah. So what, what foster dads get to do is, um, uh, well, uh, let me, I'll backtrack. Um, It is often the case that kids will come into a foster home and they're scared of foster dad because they're scared of men. They're scared of men in general. They don't, there's no trust relationship with men because of their past trauma. Um, Or they're just not used to being around them, frankly, because just dad's had, dad hadn't been in the picture much. Uh, And I'm, I'm generalizing. That's not always the case, but it is very often the case. So what foster dads get to do is they get to be an example of what a, what a loving man looks like, an affectionate, tender, loving man looks like. They get to be an example of, of what stability looks like and responsibility looks like. They also get to be an example of what, what a man looks like who loves his wife well and who loves kids his kids well. Um, uh, so gosh, there's just so many. They get to be an example of a man that... Um, uh, is safe and protects, mm-hmm. not creates environments of instability and lack of safety, where that's what a lot of these kids are used to. Um, and so there's really beautiful stories that I, I hear all the time of families who bring kiddos into their home. And initially there's some hesitation with foster dad because of past yeah. trauma. Uh, and then once that trust is built, uh, you know, the story then turns into like the kid is the foster dad's shadow, like always next to him, always up in his lap, right? Like always near him and just affection yeah. because maybe for the first time they're feeling the acceptance and the safety and the security and the protection of, of a man in their life um, in a way they haven't before. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Um, what is the gospel for a child of the foster care system? What is, what is the good news of, of Jesus? And, and yeah, what is, what is the gospel for them? Yeah, I think it's, well, the gospel for us is, um, God says, I see you where you are and I'm coming after you. I'm not isolating and insulating. I'm stepping into your story. That's what we call incarnation. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. I tell every pastor I know Christmas every year you have a layup opportunity to preach on caring for the vulnerable because that's what we're celebrating. God moves towards us. So the gospel for all of us is God moves towards us. He enters into our story. He wraps himself up in our story. He's broken by our story. So we don't have to be broken anymore. And when he does that, everything changes past, present, and future. It doesn't erase our past. It just changes our relationship with our past. Romans eight says, There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So now our past isn't a source of condemnation. It's a source of celebration. Wow. Look at what Jesus has done. I was once dead and now I'm alive. I was once blind and now I see. So it changes our past. It changes our present. Um, I now live in the security and the provision of being a child of God right now. It changes my present reality. 
um, in how I live, where I place my security, where I find my identity. And then it also changes my future. Um, I now have a future hope. I know that no matter how bad this world gets, how bumpy this road gets, and Jesus even says, it's going to get bumpy and it's going to mm -hmm. become increasingly bumpy, but I win in the end, right? There's hope. Glory is coming. Jesus wins. That's our future hope. So the gospel for all of us is Jesus steps into our story and changes everything past, present, and future. The gospel in foster care, I think, is the exact same, that we have the opportunity to tell kids and families, I see you where you are. And while the world says, avoid, isolate, run away, move across town, build a gate, mm -hmm. put up a security system, I'm actually <laughs> going to move towards you. I'm going to enter into your story. I'm going to wrap myself up in your story. I'm going to be broken by your story. And we're going to begin to write a new story together. Uh, your past no longer has to drag you down. It doesn't have to define you. We're not going to pretend like it never happened. We can't just erase it. I don't think Jesus says, hey, now that you're saved, let's just pretend like that past thing never happened. He says, no, I want <laughs> yeah. you to, I want to redeem the relationship you have with your past. So um, what if your past can now no longer be this thing that drags you down and defines you, but actually this thing that God uses um, for good in the future? Um, it changes your present reality. We want you to live now in the security and the provision of, of a stable, loving home. For us as foster families, that means us right now, but also we wanna pursue the same for your biological family. We wanna see healing and restoration and stability so that you can go back home and it'd be healthy for you, a new present reality. And then a future, a changed future trajectory. Um, we want you to know that there's hope, that there's always hope. You don't have to be afraid of tomorrow. So here's the truth is that a lot of kids, especially the older they get in the system, um, there's no thought of tomorrow. There's no concept of the future because they spend their days surviving that day. Hmm. I got to get through today. Got to do whatever I have to do to make it through today with no concept of how that affects tomorrow. So when all that you have um, every day is the obligation to survive, mm -hmm. you have no time left to dream about the future because I just got to get through today. I, I'll do whatever I have to do, lie, steal, manipulate, whatever I got to do to get through today. I'll deal with the consequences tomorrow and I'll get through tomorrow, right? Day by day. Now what we get to do is create an environment that says, look, you don't just have to survive today. You can live in a, in a comfort and a stability and an assurance of knowing um, that you don't have to fight, you don't have to survive today. Um, and because of that, you can actually, it can create space now to dream about the future. Uh, so I'll, I'll never forget, uh, we had a 17 year old move in with us and she had just had a little baby boy. And uh, she came to us one night and said, and this is a girl who spent 17 years of her life surviving each day, no concept of the future or tomorrow. And she came to us one night and said, hey, I've been thinking, I think I want to know, I think I know what I want to do after high school. Like I want to, what I want to be when I grow up, basically is what she was saying. And she said she wanted to be a social worker so that she could be a caseworker for kids in foster care. And she said, I want to do that because my whole life, uh, I've had caseworkers that made it worse for me. They were supposed to make it better for me, but I just had bad caseworkers. And, and I want and she said, these kids deserve good caseworkers, and I want to be a good caseworker for them. I thought, you know what? You know what you've just said? Well, not only are you dreaming about the future, probably for the first time ever, but you're dreaming about the future because of your past. And I mm -hmm. love that. Hey, my life up till this point has been pretty awful. Uh, and there's other kids out there like me that deserve better. And so I want to take my past redeem my relationship with it and use it for the good of others moving forward. And that I believe is the story of the gospel. Wow. That, that is, that is incredible. I love that. Um, so me and my wife, we just got married. We want to foster in the future. Um, we definitely aren't ready to yet. You know, we're, we're settling into to marriage, but we, we want to be preparing. So what can we do or what can anyone do who isn't ready yet to foster, but has a desire to in the future? How can we be preparing now? 
Yeah, it's all about proximity. It's just getting a little bit closer. It's ta- it's turning that six foot wall into six inch steps. So mm-hmm. um, find ways to serve, find ways to get a little bit closer to the foster care community. Um, now I will tell you, I was just uh, in an interview the other day with someone who um, they've been married, I don't know, 15, 16 years now, but their story is uh, they'd been married four months. They were sitting in church uh, it was about foster care. They signed up for training. They figured it might take them about a year to get through the whole thing. Uh, they actually had an expedited weekend blitz training. Uh, they went to it, they got trained and, uh, at five months of marriage, uh, they got a call for a sibling set of four kids. Uh, and those kids eventually never went home and they adopted them. And so they've said since five months of marriage, We've had four kids. Uh, (laughs) So watch out. But we say proximity, right? Just get a little bit closer. Find ways to serve and support foster families in your church or your community. Get involved in initiatives that that directly impact kids and families or foster families. Get a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Uh, And and here's what we say. Uh, From a distance, things you don't see things clearly. Um, And we fill that gap between where we are and where whatever it is that we're looking at, we fill it with oftentimes uh, false ideas, right? Like misconceptions, false paradigms, uh, you know, uh, unrealistic fears, unrealistic, but the closer we get, uh, the more, the clearer we begin to see it. Uh, And um, a lot of those questions start to go away. We start to understand it a little bit more. And then that's where God, you know, says, Hey, now that you're starting to see a little bit more, um, uh, here's what I'm thinking for you, right? So I, I say this, a lot of times we spend a lot of time praying to God for clarity. And perhaps what we need to spend more time doing is praying to God for courage. Mm. Um, because I think sometimes his answer to our prayer for clarity is, um, hey, you're never going to get clarity if you stay that far away. So we say, God, give me clarity. And he says, okay, move a little bit closer. And then you'll start to see, it'll become more clear. And we go, but I don't want to move closer. That seems hard and uncomfortable. And he's going, well, then quit praying to me for clarity, pray (laughs) for courage, right? Because what you need now is not clarity, you need courage to move a little bit closer. And then I'll tell you, um, I'll be honest, uh, there's a lot of people out there that need to stop praying about foster care. Uh, God's done having that conversation with you. Look, I have four kids. We've all been kids. Many, most of us have had parents. They've told us what to do. And we haven't done it, right? Like if I tell my kid to clean her room and uh, f- for 15 minutes, she keeps asking me, okay, what do you want me to do? I want you to clean your room. Okay, wait, wait, just to be clear. What do you want me to do? I want you to clean your room. Like at some point I say, you know, she comes and says, Hey, what do you want me to do? And my answer is, well, what I want you to do is stop asking me what I want you to do. I've been clear. I've made it clear. Now do it. So uh, let me be, uh, let me be the prophet, but try to also be the priest here. (laughs) Okay. Uh, There's a lot of you that have been praying about it, reading about it, talking about it, going to conferences about it, reading blogs, praying about it more, talking about it more, trying to figure out, is this the right time and all that, da, 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 and praying to God about it more and more and more. And he's up there going, everything that I've had to say about this has been said. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's time for you to just clean your room. Uh, and um, and I've, I've made it clear in your heart. I've made it clear in my word. I've made it clear in the community of people around you. Um, I've made it clear through the experiences that I've given you, it's time to just, just do it. Um, so that's my long way of saying, move a little bit closer, Mm -hmm. pray for courage. God will give you the clarity you need when you need it. And when you need it, um, we're on a need to know basis. He'll let us know what we need to know when we need to know it, as we just move a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer. Amen. That is that is challenging and convicting, and I hope for many of our listeners, uh, they've got some stuff to think about. If you have enjoyed this conversation, you can get Jason's books, Reframing Foster Care, 
and everyone can do something at jasonjohnsonblog.com. I am reading Everyone Can Do Something right now. I'm really enjoying uh, the format of it. I was very surprised when I opened it up. It feels more like a keynote presentation in a good way. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Lots of headings and lots of uh, infographs and, and things yes. like that. So it's been very, for a visual learner, it's been very engaging for me. Uh, I've, I've been really enjoying that. Awesome. Um, I end each episode by asking for a few recommendations of some kind, um, books, podcasts, uh, whatever you are consuming right now and whatever you think would be beneficial for our listeners. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think I mentioned them earlier, but um, anything by Chip and Dan Heath, uh, I have found to be incredibly helpful. They they do um, a lot of Fortune 500, you know, consulting, but, but really their big thing is organizational change and the idea of how do we how do we move from here to there? And I think that's kind of what, a lot of what we're talking about here. Like, how do I move from where I am to maybe what God is calling me to, to do? And um, so their books are fantastic. Uh, most recently, uh, myself and a couple other guys on our team read their new book called Upstream, which is just brilliant. Um, and it has so much application to the foster care child welfare world. The idea of um, in order to solve problems downstream, maybe we need to go back upstream and figure out what's causing these problems in the first place. And it's just super helpful. So I would start there. Uh, also just recently finished reading a book. Uh, I can't pronounce his name because it's German, but you can find it. It's called Excellence Wins. And it's written by the guy who founded the Ritz-Carlton Hotel chain. And uh, oh, for so sure. if, if you're familiar with Ritz-Carlton, they're known for their excellence. And their tagline is, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And I love it. But it, it just kind of unpacks like how they've trained and built out an organization of people that are all about doing things with excellence. And it, it uh, the disclaimer here is if you read that book, and then you start going to stores or coffee shops or restaurants or whatever. I need I need you to be aware. If you read that book, you're going to be sorely disappointed <laughs> with most of your customer service experiences because they've set such a high bar. But man, it's so good. So I would check that out as well. Cool. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much for being on. I've had a great time talking to you. And I'm sure our listeners were super blessed by this conversation. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.